Excellent. Well, <laughs> well, while I'm here, I was here not that long ago. I was actually here earlier this month. It was absolutely incredible to be here. Um, and I feel extremely fortunate we actually got to go to Queenstown. Um, and so, yes, yeah, getting to spend a little bit of time in this beautiful country. So today what I want to talk about is two very important things. I want to talk about the importance of perseverance and I also want to talk about the importance of dreaming. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is sharing the 10-year story behind Canva's overnight success. So I want to tell you a little bit about something that I have done at yoga a couple of times. So you go into the room and you've got your yoga mat and you're kind of sitting there and everyone's ignoring each other and feeling very serious, ready for their practice. And sometimes the teacher will say, turn to the person next to you and introduce yourself. And the really wonderful thing about that is it kind of breaks the ice and makes everyone realise everyone else is just humans and you kind of feel like a little bit more friendship to the people around you. So what I'd like you to do is exactly that for a moment. Turn to the person next to you and literally shake their hand and say hi. So you've got a friend for the day and someone you don't know questions just to kick things off so stand up if you have ever failed at something or been rejected literally stand up for me yeah that is pretty much everyone hey unfortunately but that is a reality of life and now I want you to sit down if when you were rejected you felt like giving up yeah I would totally sit down as well <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm impressed to see the number of people that are still standing. I think, that, and you may sit down now. <laughs> that is a very perseverant crowd. I think that the, the reality is when you are rejected, you feel a lot like giving up and stopping because that is kind of a natural human reaction because that feels really, really awkward when you are rejected. But I think what's really important is to persevere and continue and continue again and get rejected and rejected again, which feels completely outrageous and like the exact opposite of what feels natural. Because rejection is hard. And trying again and being told that something isn't working, that you don't have whatever it is that you need, it doesn't really feel like you should try and try again. But what I want to do today is to show that rejection and perseverance are two very critical ingredients to succeed at literally any goal that you put your mind to. So I'm going to share our story today, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about dreaming, and we're going to do a little fun workshop. So it wasn't that long ago that I was at university in Perth, Western Australia, and I was teaching design programs and thought they were really, really hard and complicated. Um, and there was this whole crazy world, so usually you'd have to go purchase Adobe, then study design for a while, then purchase and download stock photos from a stock photography library, and purchase fonts from a font library, and purchase layouts, and deep at each image, and prepare vectors and illustrations, and then design. You take all those ingredients and actually create design. Then upload and email the PDF, and then make revisions, and then prepare it for web or print thought this was crazy and that in the future this entire design ecosystem should be integrated into one page and made accessible to the whole world. Um, so who's used a professional design tool before? Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, it's crazy just how complicated they are. There's also lots and lots of big companies, obviously Microsoft and Google and you know, a couple of other ones in there, um, but then lots of other companies like stock photography sites and stock layout sites and font foundries and file sharing services and professional print companies thought that was ridiculous. They should be integrated in, into one page. Um, sh you should be able to have one click access to all the professional design tools, a library of millions of images, a design marketplace. You should be able to collaborate online. And then finally, you should be able to click a button and export it to a video or a social media platform or a website or a presentation. Um, you shouldn't have to use different tools for each of these things. Not a bad vision, hey? I thought it was pretty cool. But the reality was that I was 19 and I was at university and I had no business experience or software experience or marketing experience or literally any relevant experience. So my boyfriend became my business partner. We took over my mum's living room um, and set to work. Um, and 
it's created, rather than trying to take on the entire world of design at this point in time, decided to take on school yearbooks in Australia. This is us standing very proudly with our very first website. Um, and the, we then took over my mum's entire living room, an entire house. Um, we ended up with printing presses, you can see in that photo there. Um, we had printing presses and staff, and then we started taking over her garage and ended up with that being our storeroom of ink and paper and waste cartridges, um, and had deliveries of trucks with paper, because we were printing these yearbooks. Um, and yeah, then we started a tradition which we've continued today, which I particularly like, which is having lunch together um, every day. And that's a really fun because you get to know people um, outside your, um, in, as human beings rather than just as um, team members. And we started to take increasingly dorky photos. Um, <laughs> but this is us with our growing team um, with, that, with that, some of the first yearbooks that we had created. Um, and then we were just doing absolutely everything under the sun in order to help expand this. So um, I made all of these banners and we were going to expos. It was a fail. Don't, don't go to an expo where there are more <coughs> exhibitors than there are attendees. That did not work so well. Um, <laughs> but we're just trying everything we possibly could. Um, and I even went in this Inventor of the Year competition. It was called um, WA Inventor of the Year, so we wanted to sound really inventory. So this was the title, The World's Most Sophisticated and Easy to Use Multi-Use Publishing System. Well, that sounded pretty cool. Um, and then I also was trying to look really professional, so I started wearing business suits to every single meeting. Um, but we came runner-up in WA Inventor of the Year. Um, and met this guy called Bill Tai, who was over from Silicon Valley. He was this investor from Silicon Valley. And despite the fact we'd had a company for a number of years, we had not um, heard much about the whole venture capital world or the whole startup world. Um, and so this was really like a whole new window into another world. Um, and so I put together another deck, uh, The Future of Publishing, and talked about the convergence of industries and how we were going to beat Google Docs and Microsoft Web Apps, who was totally chained to the old way of doing things, and we're going to become the dominant online publishing system of the future. Um, Bill said that if I met with him, he'd be happy... Um, if I went to San Francisco, he'd be happy to meet with me. So I went to San Francisco um, and just got rejected a lot. Um, <laughs> so it was really... Um, so I was pitching people, trying to get them to join my tech team. I was pitching investors, trying to get them to invest. And most people were saying that, for various reasons, and there were many, uh, that they weren't really quite ready. Unfortunately, right now, I do not think that it is quite the right fit just now. We have reached the conclusion that the $8 million cap is above the top end of what we think is fair value. My the biggest issue is physical distance. A lot of people said that they need to be able to ride their bicycle to our office, and they couldn't really do that from Silicon Valley, um, and et cetera, et cetera. They weren't happy to invest in an Australian startup. So many other reasons. And each of these hurt a lot. Um, and you know, I'm not sure it's going to make sense just right now. Other people told us that um, the size of the, the market, does a design product for non-designers was just like an oxymoron. Why would you do that? <laughs> um, there were so many rejections, and each one of them really hurt. Um, and I asked the question that, uh, in, at the start, who has been rejected, and pretty much everyone stood up, and who feels like giving up? And half of you sat down. Well, I'd be in the half that sat down because rejection really hurts. But I think that what you feel like doing and what you kind of need to do to actually get to that goal can sometimes be quite opposite things. So we persevered for years. It was actually three years between first meeting an investor, Bill, and then actually landing investment. Um, but then eventually we raised our seed round and we were extremely excited um, because all of a sudden we could start to grow our team. And we did. And we started, after a year of development, to be ready to launch Canva to the world. And we were so incredibly excited to finally get Canva out into the world. And then we started to grow our community. And after one year, we had 1.3 million designs created per month. 
and our team was excessively excited about this. <laughs> and after two years, we had 5.8 million designs created per month. You can see those one million designs looked really tiny. Um, and if you kind of go like five years back from the start of that graph, that's really where the journey really began. And now after five years, we have an incredible team of 700 people across the globe. And give me a drum roll, so you just a little more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now after we have 110 million designs created per month. It's pretty wild. In fact, yesterday, five million designs were created. Um, this is in 190 countries across the globe. Um, this is everyone getting their small business off the ground, creating a school assignment, creating a presentation, social media graphics, marketing materials. That entire vision that we have initially had has actually started to come true, which is completely crazy and really, really exciting. Um, you know, we've had 1.8 billion designs being created now. Um, every month, more than 20 million people are using Canva. And we have this incredible <coughs> team. We've got you know, 700 members and you know, a few offices across the globe. And last night I was searching for Love Canva, and there's just so many people saying that. It's really, really cool to see. We've got 30,000 nonprofits where we give our, non our paid product away for free, um, and the number of nonprofits that are using the product um, to help really get to their mission and to be more effective um, is incredibly cool. We also have su support of some really incredible investors. A number of them will be in the room today. <coughs> I guess, despite the fact I was trying to tell you about the pain and the rejection and the problems and the trials and the tribulations over the last 10 years, that was 10 years in a tiny little nutshell. And that really was my highlight reel. And that's why I love this quote so much. Um, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes footage with everyone else's highlight reel. And I think that that is what I want you to all take away today, is just how true that is. Here's a note that I wrote to myself back in 2011. This was quite a low moment. All that rejection started to actually weigh on me. Mel, you're extremely tired. You're in a challenging situation, though you can pull through. Nothing bad is really happening. You're just feeling depressed because you're used to achieving things quickly. It's a hard environment. There is no doubt you will succeed and you'll find the team you need, get the investment you need, and build the company you've always wanted. You have chosen to put yourself in a challenging situation. If it wasn't challenging, you wouldn't feel as satisfied when you get to the end goal. I think that that... I, had, I saw that years after, and I'd kind of forgotten just how intense that period of time was, being rejected time and time again. It doesn't feel nice, but it's also a really important thing because you learn every time we were rejected, we'd refine our strategy, we'd pick ourselves up and do it again and again and again. We'd get a little better each time, but we kept on continuously trying to move towards that. But I think what's so incredibly important to know is that every single person is on this roller coaster ride, and one day you feel like you're on top of the world, and the next you feel like the world is on top of you, and it kind of just keeps seesawing between those things. But you just have to keep on making a little progress each time. Um, and I think knowing that this is the case for absolutely everyone, like no one has had it easy, no one has been able to just like walk out and have everything work for them. It's constantly a battle, it's constantly a, a challenge, and there's so many things you need to do. I think knowing that that's the same for absolutely everyone can be slightly more encouraging. So I think what we have to do is just keep on planting seeds um, until one eventually grows. So hopefully that gave you a little indication of the importance of perseverance and the importance of dreaming. But what I want to do right now is to double down <coughs> on the importance of dreaming. This is a great quote from Jeff Bezos that I thought was particularly apt. Friends congratulate me after a quarterly earnings announcement and say, good job, great quarter. And I'll say, thank you, but that quarter was baked three years ago. I'm working on a quarter that'll happen in 2021 right now. I thought this was particularly interesting. So, where do you live? Do you live, raise your hand, in the past? Do you live 
Yeah, there's a few people living in the past. That kind of makes sense because there's a lot of things you need to take from and learn from there. Who lives in the present? Feeling like you're kind of day to day having to operate, yeah? Most people kind of get dragged here because that's kind of where you literally are. <laughs> and then in one year in the future? Yeah, a few more hands, excellent. What about five years in the future? Excellent to see a few hands. And what about 10 years in the future? A couple, a couple. Okay, so I think that the reality is that there's always a lot of noise, and especially if you're starting a startup, um, there's so many things that take priority and brings you back to the, uh, to the, to the present or the past even. Um, so what I want to do today is just take a little moment to dream together. Why? Why is dreaming so important? If you don't dream about the future, you can't make it happen, frankly. Uh, knowing where you're headed can help you move a lot faster. So I think, for me, if I have a really clear understanding of where I'm going, I can make lots and lots of quick decisions. But if I don't have a clear understanding of where I'm going, it makes decision making way harder. It also helps with our investors and team. So by having a really clear picture of where we're going, we've been able to show that to investors. Um, got rejected a lot in the early days, but then eventually found some amazing investors who believed in our vision. But then we could just demonstrate that we, and continue to execute upon that. For our team, we show every one of our team members when they join Canva our vision. We've got a vision deck and we go through this in a great amount of detail, which means that they can help to achieve that dream and we can continue to um, tick off the things and just work towards that. You can only grow as big as your dreams. Um, I think that that is also a pretty important note to make because if you can't dream that far, you can't really get that far. Um, and so what we do at Canva is we really transform our dreams into our mission and goals. Um, and so our mission is to empower the world to design, um, which has meant that we need to empower everyone to design anything with every ingredient in every language on every device. Um, so the mission is sort of that big moon, where you, where you want to go in the long run, and then goals are little steps along the way. So I'll show you how this works in practice. Um, so as I mentioned, Empower the World to Design requires us to be in every language. Um, so we put up on the wall our goals. Um, one, this was back in 2016. We said we were going to launch Spanish. Um, and we did, which was incredibly exciting. And then we had these little fun celebrations. This was a little La Tomatina festival where we threw tomatoes the team chose there in celebration <laughs> at, the, at the team that had made this magical thing happen. Um, but we've released doves and we've had a little holly festival where we threw ink, all sorts of fun things we've done over the years. Um, and then we launched in 20 languages in 2016. Then we launched in 100 languages in 2017. Um, then in 2018, we launched in some hard languages. So we launched in China, and we launched in right-to-left languages, um, like Arabic and Hebrew and Urdu. And this year, there's been a really strong focus on international feature parity. So ensuring everyone can pay in their local currency, ensuring everyone can have their local fonts. Um, and now, English markets more, more account for more than 50% of our community. <coughs> so you can tell how having that really big mission and then taking incremental steps incre and uh, having little goals every single year, every single season, for us seasons are winter, summer, autumn, spring. We think that's a bit more fun than quarters. Um, <laughs> is um, really, really important to get there. And it's just had such a huge impact. Um, and so I guess across each of these, every single year, we're making little steps in these in this direction. So when planning, what most people do, and it makes perfect sense why this happens, is you kind of look at the Lego blocks that you have right now. You're like, I've got two Lego blocks. What can I build with my two Lego blocks? And that's sort of planning from the present moment in time. And that makes a lot of sense, because you kind of need to look at what you've got, and then you need to make decisions based on that. But what I think is really important to do, which I think can be done a lot more of, is planning where you want to be in 10 years. So you don't have the Lego box to go and build that amazing city. But I think it's really, really important to get a clear picture in your head of what you'd like that city to look like. Even if you have absolutely none of the tools, none of the equipment, and certainly none of the Lego blocks to actually make that happen. <laughs> so a really fun thing to think about is what do you think your industry will look like in 10 years' time? And in fact, you don't even need to think about it for your own industry if you don't even have an industry yet. <laughs> you can think about the future of cars, the future of transportation, the future of communication. Um, and this is a really, really fun exercise to do. Um, when I do that, I always think that the future is kinder and more efficient and more egalitarian. Um, and get a really, really clear picture of that in your head. So it's a really fun question to ponder. Another fun question to... Oh, 
Yes. So what you don't want to do. This is what I think is, you don't want to have a little ladder and you climb to the top and you get to the top of that ladder and you're like, what do I do next? You also don't want to have a really tall ladder but not take the steps, have any steps to get there. That's just called dreams, but without actually ever turning that into reality. What you want to do if you can possibly do this, is have a really long ladder all the way to the moon, but then to be able to take little steps in that direction. And those steps don't need to be big at all. They can just be a really tiny little step. Um, but at that step, you'll learn something, and then you'll be a little bit more prepared, a little bit more experienced, ready to take the next step. So when I was talking about our experience with Fusion Books, that wasn't, we had this big vision, but rather than being you know, in the middle and being like, oh my god, that's a big vision, that's impossible to do, we sort of just took a little step at a time in that direction. Another fun question to ponder is what would you like the world to look like in the future? And the more time that you can spend on these questions that are really fun to ponder, um, the more that you can actually start to turn that into reality. You might be able to think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. How could you turn these things into reality? How could you create a company that could move in that direction? And this is a really, really fun exercise to do if you've got a founding team. Um, actually, with your whole company, we do this uh, with different groups all the time. <coughs> is what would wild success look like in 10 years and what would wild failure look like in 10 years? And so by using these sorts of questions, it helps to take planning from looking at the Lego blocks that you have, or very specifically often don't have, and starting to think about the possibilities starting to think about what is that dream state that you would like to be working towards. So they're three pretty fun questions to ponder to help you dream more about the future. So hopefully today I've helped to instill the importance of perseverance and the importance of dreaming. Here's a really lovely quote that's on our print packaging that means a lot to me. It always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you. That is the end. Thank you.